Okay, Romans chapter 8. And I don't know where I left off. Verse 30. Yeah, that's, that's about right. Okay. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll start with the first um, verse 26. <laughs> All right. Are you with me? Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself Help, makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknow, foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. Hmm, I think I'll start right there. Whom, um, moreover, whom he predestined. So the Lord has predestined us to be conformed to the image of Christ. So, so when you received Christ, when you believed on him, the predestination for your life was for you to become like Jesus. You think like him, and you walk like him, and you talk like him, you do like Jesus. That's, that's what God, for whom he did foreknow, then he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of Christ, that Christ might be the firstborn among many brethren. So if you look at your life and you see what you are to become, look at Jesus, and that's what you're to become. That's what the Lord predestined you for. So that's why when we, when we read these two verses prior to that, he says, we know all things work together for good. And he said before that, he said, the Spirit helps our infirmities. We don't know how to pray as we ought. And so we don't. Um, we think we know what, we, what to pray for, but the Spirit of God knows what you need for you to become a son of God. For you to, I hope I'm making that sure, um, uh, understandable. God wants you to, be, to become a son of God. Whenever you were born again, when you received the Spirit of Christ, you, you received the authority for you to become a son of God. And you are in the process of becoming, and you are becoming what you think and what you do. Man does not live by bread alone, but he lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every seven years, you get a new body. Hallelujah! Woo! <laughs> you, you know how you get a new body? You are what you eat. Amen? My body takes the food that I eat and metabolizes it. And, and it creates new cells from it. Amen? And so every seven years, I'm new. I'm, I am sloughing off cells while you're right here right now. You don't even know it, but you're sloughing off millions of cells while you sit here. Even if you're 66 or, or 12 years old or 74, like some people in this room. And, um, and so... So, so, the, so the Lord wants us to become like him, and so we don't know how to pray like we ought. But the, whole, but the Holy Spirit prays through us. And, and, um, and, as he's, and he prays through us with moans and groanings and that kind of stuff. And he's praying through us, and the, and the Spirit knows what the mind and the will of God is because God is praying through you. The Holy Spirit's praying through you to the Father, for the Father to do in you what he needs to do for you to become like Jesus. And then he says, and we know all things work together for good to them that love God. So you start going through something, you might, say, you might be saying, this isn't good. 
But, he's, but he knows this is good because this is meant for your good. This is meant to take you and conform you to the image of Christ. Amen? And so, so then he says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among ma many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. So if you are, if you've received Christ, you have, you have a call of God on your life. And God is calling you. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So God called you. And God didn't call you because you are all that in a bag of chips. And God didn't call you because you have a wonderful record and you are just ready to be, um, to, to just step up and, and, and be the specimen before the whole world of here is the child of God. No, he called you. He called you. And whom he called, these he also justified. To justify is to declare right. And so, so he declares you right. How does he declare you right? When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, your faith in Jesus is, is what gives you righteousness. Righteousness is imputed to you when you believe on Jesus. When you believe what God did, when you believe who God sent, then, then your faith is imputed to you for righteousness. Whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. What does that mean? Glad you asked. You start off where you're at. Where are we? The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so, so okay, do me a favor. Let's kind of pay attention here. So, because you know what you do whenever you don't pay attention? You distract me. And I, I'm trying to teach. Thank you. Okay, listen. So, so... Whom he justified, then he glorified. So if God says, you're just. God says, you're right. Somebody else may say you're wrong, but God says, you're right. I called you, and I call you right. I call you, and you can do what I called you to do, because I say you can, not because anybody else says you can. No one else can stop you except you. If, because if God calls you for something, the, the, it's the Lord who qualifies you. It's the Lord who's declared you righteous. Even though the rest of the world says you're not. You know what? The anointing breaks the yoke. The anointing shatters the, the anointing of God. You know, you know uh, when Samuel went to David, you know what he did? He took a horn of oil and he poured it on David's head. You know what the horn of oil did? The anointing of God came on David for David to be king. And he was anointed as king over Israel. And, and God was on him for that job. And, and the Lord stayed on him, the Spirit of God stayed on him the rest of his life. For that job. Whenever, when the anointing of God comes on you, it's for what God's called you for. Whom, whom he, he said, um, let's just read it again. He says, moreover whom he predestined, these he called, and whom he called, these he justified, and who he justified, these he glorified. So he calls you, and you respond to the call, and you begin to, to uh, in your responding to the call of God, you say, here I am. Take me. Teach me. Make my life count. And the Lord says, that's exactly what I want to do. So he starts doing it. And, 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 and the reason why you can do what he called you to do is because he said you could. David's brothers David's dad didn't see him as king of Israel. His brothers, after he was anointed king, said, what are you doing? We know the naughtiness of your heart, you know. And, and, and they didn't see it, but they couldn't stop him because the anointing of God was on him for him to do what God called him to do. When you say yes to Jesus, the anointing of God is on your life for you to accomplish what he gave you life for. And you start to do that, and uh, has everybody got your cell phones put away? 
Yes, good. That's good. Let's keep them all put away. We're here for this. All right. So, so you start to do what God calls you to, to do, and you, can, and you can do it. Listen, why am, I, why am I spending time on this? Because many of you have to get past you. You've got to get past you first. Because there's a voice on the inside that says, I can't do that. You don't know what my record is. You don't know what my jacket is. You don't, you, all that kind of stuff. But the Lord says, if I told you you can, you can. I, I, didn't, I didn't check with any of them to find out what I wanted you to do. And, and he says, the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. And so no one else can say, it's, you're not going to do that. No, because the Lord says, I say you are. So, 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 so he, he called me. He justified me, and now he, he glorifies me. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God is bringing many sons unto glory. And <clears throat> glory, glory in your life, you know, you, know, uh, you know what it looks like? It looks like Jesus. It looks like the Spirit of God whenever whenever, um, when, you, when you find yourself being glorified. Um, the path to glory is, it's, a, can, can I just be real with you? It's a path of, it's painful change. Do you know why it's painful change? Because you are changing from who you are into what God wants you to be, which is not, it's not, it's not natural to you. It's not natural to you for you to walk in the will of God and for you to do the will of God. It's not natural in your thinking. You want to do, which you want to handle situations the way you've learned how to handle them. You want to talk the way you've learned how to talk. You want to spend your money the way, you've, the way you want it. You want to spend your time the way you want to do it. But whenever you, when, when the Lord takes you and he begins to shape you for what he wants, and you submit to it, you start doing it, you start being glorified. And, and in, in being glorified, you start suffering because you're suffering because you are losing your identity and taking on his. Losing yours, taking on his. Letting go of yours, taking on his. Fighting against yours, taking on his. Letting go of who you are, the way you've done life, the way you've done things, and taking on the identity of Christ in you. Christ being formed in you. Amen? That's what Paul says. I'm praying for you that Christ be formed in you. That doesn't happen easily. And so, so, but he glorifies us. And Peter says, if you suffer for his namesake, the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And, uh, and so, and, and so, and we, we read last week in verse 30, he says, moreover, whom he Oh, no, wait a minute. Let me see. I'm looking for... Oh, yeah. Verse 17. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. He wants me to be glorified with him. Jesus wants me to walk around in this world like... He said, Christ in you is the hope of glory. He wants me to walk around like Jesus grows up inside of me, and so Jesus is walking inside of me, doing what he does inside of me. When I'm real young in Christ, there's, I, I, I act like a little child I, because there are Christian children. And then there's Christian young men. What's a Christian young man? Let me tell you what a Christian young man is. A Christian young man is one who learns how to overcome the evil one. That's what John says. I write to you little children because you've known the Father. I write to you young men because you've overcome the evil one. Amen? And then what do you become after that? A father. I write to you fathers 
Amen? And so, so what's happening? I'm being, I'm being glorified. Christ is being glorified in me, and I'm being glorified in him. And, and he says, he said, um, that, that we also may be glorified together. And then Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So, there is a glory that gets revealed now, but there's a glory that we'll have when we get there. But there's a glory that gets revealed now, and that glory is Christ formed in me, so that I don't live like I used to. I don't think like I used to. I don't do like I used to. On purpose, I don't. On purpose, I give myself to God. On purpose, I live by the word of God. And as I do that, I change from glory to glory to glory to glory. Amen? Hallelujah. I'm preaching better than you're amening. Okay, so he says, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. What, uh, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore is also risen. Who, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written... For your sakes, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul is giving us, he's giving us the formula for growth in God and growth into what God wants us to be. Growth into what he says earlier in the chapter, he says, all creation is groaning in travail, waiting for God's sons to be manifested. God wants you to be manifested. In other words, he wants you to be seen as a son of God. If you get a demonic manifestation what does it look like looks like a demon amen acts like a demon so you know i i, I have I, I i've seen several of them I, i've seen some person slither like a snake you know do all kinds of stuff you know i mean people can do the craziest things whenever they're under the influence of a demon but whenever you're the under under the influence of God, of Christ, you act like him. But, but you don't get to the place where, where Jesus lives his life out like he wants to in you un unless you give yourself to him and to the process that he wants to work in you. So, so we, we just got done talking about being glorified. And then he says, what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? God is for you. Are you for God? Jesus said, Jesus said, where I am, there my servant shall be also. Amen? So I, I, I don't say, I, I'm yours, Jesus, I'm for you, I'm, but I'm at the bar and Jesus is at church. Amen? Jesus said, where I am, there my servant will be also. And so I, if I'm his servant, I am where he wants me. I am where he is, because he's got a job for me to do. Amen? And so, so what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Life along the way has stuff that comes up and wants to speak to you and, and, and tell you, forget all that stuff. You can't have that. But, but the Lord says quite opposite. He says, who, 
He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how, she, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God gave Jesus. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He gave Jesus to die in our place because God so loves us. Amen? And so I don't care, I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care what is trying to hold you back or anything like that. God's for you. God wants, God wants you to make it. God, um, and, and, um, and God gave Jesus, and the Bible says, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. And so if God did all that, what is it, what's he going to keep from you? What do you need now? He'll give you whatever you need. Amen? He will freely give us all things. Who shall bring charge against, a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. And so, so here you are. And, and I say, I got a rap sheet, yay long. Man, you know, I got, I got all this kind of stuff, and all this, this stuff talks against me. And God says, who's going to bring a charge against my elect? Who, who's... To bring a charge against who? They can, they can, you know, the devil is, you watch the news and you'll find, you, you, you'll find this person's got bad things to say about that one, that one's got bad th things to say about that one. I mean, there's just all kinds of accusation all the time, but with, and, and you know what Satan means? It means accuser. He is the accuser of the brethren. He, he not, he's got nothing to say good about you, and he wants to keep you from everything that God is calling you to. But the Lord says, who's going to bring a charge? I'm the one who justified. I'm the one who, said, I'm the one who declared you right and declared you able to do what I'm calling you to do. And so who's going to stand up and, 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 and say something that I say, oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh, my goodness. Not going to happen. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Jesus died in our place, died for us, died for our sins, raised from the, from the grave, and he's at, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, and he prays for you now. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Who shall sep separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? What is, what is going to separate you from, from God's love for you, from the love of Christ? Nothing. Not one thing. Not, he says, shall tribulation, trouble, trouble won't do it. You know what happens when you, when you find yourself in trouble? The Bible says he's a very present help in the time of trouble. I've, I've never experienced God as close as when I've been in the worst trouble I've ever been in. He's there. His presence, he's a very present help. And so, <clears throat> shall, shall uh, tribulation or distress? No, no, he's there. Shall, shall persecution? No, he's there. What do you get persecuted for? You get persecuted because you're doing what God wants you to do. Amen? Jesus said, you're blessed. He said, you're blessed when people persecute you for righteousness sake, and they say all manner of evil against you. He said, he says, don't curse them. Bless them. Yeah. Shall famine separate you from the love, from the love of Christ? No. Nope. Shall nakedness Shall peril or sword? None of those do. He says, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. If I'm going to walk with God and I'm going to do the will of God, I'm going to walk through what God brings me through in order for me to do it. I get one shot at life. It's appointed unto man who wants to die. After this is the judgment. So I get my one shot at life, and if I want my life to count, then I look to the giver of life to find out what makes it count. And whenever I look to the giver of life, and he gives me marching orders, he gives me a, a task, he gives me a job that, that before he formed me in the womb, he made me for, and he gives me this job, here's, he said, he said, for your sake, we are killed all day long. 
We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Paul writes in Corinthians, and, and he's talking about his own life. And he said, death works in us, but life in you. And so the very things that he was going through were working a death in him to his flesh. But out of that death to his flesh came life and came, you know what it came? This. There's not one Christian, not one Christian who grows in Christ without hearing what Paul said. God gave him a job to do and death was working in him. And while death worked in him, life worked in us. And the life is, he received revelation from God, so much so that he wrote two-thirds of the, of the New Testament, two-thirds to three-quarters of the New Testament by himself. He wrote it, we, re we read it, we find out how to walk this Christian walk. We find out how to live for God. And, and so, so death works in us. So we're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. What's God called you to do? Where's, where has, where's the X for your spot? What are you supposed to be doing? What's the Lord put on your heart? What's he brought in front of you that you're supposed to do? Whenever you get busy, or, or, or if you choose to do what God calls you to do, don't cry about difficulty. Difficulty is going to be there. Um, Paul is quoting from the Old Testament. For your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. And so we face stuff. We face stuff. Why? Because, because if my kids are going to come to know God, if my family's going to come to know God, if my neighbors are going to come to know God, if the people that I work with are going to come to know God, I'm the light of the world. I'm the city that's set on the hill. If I'm not there to bring the knowledge of Christ to them, who are they going to get it through? So if I'm there to do what God calls me to do, don't complain. He said, I don't care what the problem is. In all these things, we're more than conquerors. Amen? He conquered death and hell and the grave. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He won for us. He's ascended on high. He's sitting at the right hand of, the, of God. He ever lives to make, to inter make intercession for us. And we can win. How do I lose? I start moaning and, and, and complaining about my lot in life and how rough, how, how rough life is. And, and, and I start looking at the, at the have-nots and all that kind of stuff, you know. Man, get busy with what God called you to. You get busy with what, what God called you to, you won't have enough time to get it done. Amen? You won't. Life will... You listen... Life goes by so fast, and it's because there is there is so much to do. There's not a boring day. Yeah, I haven't had a. I've been Christian now 48 years. Now, let me see. How many times have I been bored in 48 years? You know, I I I can't remember it. You don't live a boring life. You get. You know what you're called to? You're called to. You're called to use what He already put inside of you. And you're called to accentuate that with his word. Learn how to use it through his word. <clears throat> and so, so you're not defeated. You're more than a conqueror through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. This is nothing that can, that can, that can keep the love of God in Christ Jesus from uh, um, filling your heart, filling your life, enabling you to overcome and walk as an overcomer in life. He says, he says neither death nor life. He says, neither angels nor principalities nor powers. So, so you get into the hidden realm 
and use and 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 the, the, the demonic realm the spirit realm and all that kind of stuff. He says, there's none of that that can separate you from the love of God. So get on with it. Do what God called you to do. And you'll find God is with you. And you'll find um, God is with you in a way that you haven't even experienced in the past. He says, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Chapter 9, verse 1. I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. Who is Christ? He's the eternally blessed God. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and so Paul says, Paul says, this is almost to me unfathomable. How can you wish that you were accursed from Christ? That's, that's like, I go straight to hell. But Paul says, for my own brothers, my own countrymen, the Jews, if I could get them saved, I'd go to hell. Just if, if I was guaranteed they'd be saved. He says, I wish I was cursed from Christ so that they could be saved. I don't want to be cursed from Christ. But I, but I want to see them saved that bad where I would give up my own salvation so they get saved. That is, that is what a transformation that takes place. I mean, what, what do you got to have on the inside for you to feel like that? I mean, that's the, way, that's the way God feels about you. That's the way Christ felt about you. Amen? And so, and Christ did. He gave up his life for us. Hallelujah. So, so, and he says, um, and so, you know, what, what, what came to the Jews? He says, who are Isla uh, um, for I wish I, that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises. God gave it all to, to Abraham and to his seed. And so here comes Moses, and, and Moses comes to deliver the children of Israel, and God gave the promise to Abraham that through his seed, all the earth would be blessed, and Moses comes, and, and God gives a, a law that no other nation got. This is the law of God. This is a way to live in, in national life. You know, he, the, the law is, is ceremonial. It is... It's civil and it's moral. And there's, 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 there's no other people that, that have the law that God gave. And, and so they give it to them, but they didn't get it. They didn't get it. And he says, um, uh, who, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law. What's the glory that he's talking about? The glory was they saw the Shekinah glory of God. They saw the, the waters of the Red Sea open up and all of it, the children of Israel go through on dry ground. They saw a pillar of fire that led them through the wilderness at night and a pillar of cloud, cloud that covered them from the hot sun during the day. They saw themselves get manna every day. God fed them while they were in the wilderness. They saw their, their, their shoes didn't wear out and their, their clothes didn't grow old. And uh, they saw that whenever they got done marching in the wilderness for 40 years, there was not one feeble one among them. They saw God do all kinds of things. And um, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. But it is not the word of God. Um, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. For they are not all Israel who are 
of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are the children, uh, but are, 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 are the seed of the, the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of the promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born and having done, uh, nor having done any evil or good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Okay, let's... Let's dive into that and see if we can get here. Verse 6. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. So you've got the nation of Israel over there right now. What makes you the Israel of God? You know what puts you into the Israel of God? I'm part of the Israel of God. If you're born again... You're part of the Israel of God. You're not, you're, not the, you're not the Israel of God. You may be part of Israel, but you're not the Israel of God. Because the Lord said to Abraham, he said, in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. He didn't say your seeds, plural, because Abraham had many sons. Abraham had, um, he, had, uh, he, had, he had Ishmael first, then he had Isaac, and then he had sons, six more sons, yeah, by, by other wives, uh, wives after Sarah died. And so, so, so um, the Lord said to Abraham, in your seed, and whenever the Lord said to Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go offer him up to me for a burnt offering. It was your seed. The Lord said, uh, Ab um, Ishmael was Abraham and Sarah trying to fulfill the promise of God on their own because they didn't, they, they didn't fully believe, they didn't understand, so they figured we, we better do something because, because this isn't happening. She's getting older and older and still not having any kids, and the Lord said, in your seed, all the earths are going to be blessed. And so, 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 so um, Abraham takes his maid, and, and she becomes his wife, and he has a child through her. That wasn't the seed. It was Isaac. And, and Isaac, in your seed shall all the, earth be, all the earth be blessed. When he was saying that, you know what he was saying? The seed, the seed is what the devil was trying to destroy from the very beginning. What's the seed? It's Christ. The seed is Christ. When you receive Christ, the blessing of Abraham comes on you. You are delivered from the curse of the law whenever you receive Christ. And so he says, they're not all Israel who are of Israel. So you've got a whole nation of people, and you've got a whole lot of Jews in the world today. They're not Israel. If you're born again, you're the Israel of God. Okay. Nor are they children because they are the seed of Abraham. Um, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, uh, those who are the children of, uh, of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. So the seed was in Isaac. So your, so your, um, or, or, well, let me see. Isaac was the seed that God was talking about. That was the one, even though Abraham, Abraham turned and did the other thing, and then afterwards, after he had Isaac, whenever Abraham uh, had other sons, they weren't, the blessing wasn't on them. They were sent away. And, um, but, the, the, but Isaac carried the seed that, that pro proceeded on down. Okay, so that is, those who are the children of, fle uh, uh, of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of of the promise. These are counted as the seed. Okay. 
Let's read that again. That is, those who are children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. So, I was born. You were born. So I'm, and just in being born, I'm a child of the flesh. But Jesus came and he said, you must be born again. What is, uh, and what does he say in, uh, in John? He says, being born from above. Amen? Being born from above. Yeah, I received the Spirit of Christ. Paul says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, that's being born from above. He says, these are the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as seed. Okay, for this is the word of the promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac... For the children um, not yet born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So, so here is Isaac now, and Isaac marries Rebekah, and Rebekah is pregnant, and she's got two children in her womb. And, and, and she hears a prophetic word. Of, she's wondering, what in the world is going on with me? Because the kids are just in there wrestling around inside of her womb. And she's wondering, what is my problem here? And, and, and uh, someone prophesies over her and tells her, you got two children in your, in your womb. And, and he says, the older will serve the younger. And the Lord says, in another place, he said, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Esau was the firstborn in the, from the womb. Esau was the firstborn, but Jacob was the one that had the promise. God chooses. Now, what is he saying? Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. <clears throat> Jesus said, if any man come after me and he hate not his father, his mother, his wife, his son, his daughter, yea, his own life, he can't be my disciple. Is Jesus asking you to hate your wife, to hate your mom, to hate your dad, to hate your kids? Not at all. What's he asking for? Your love for him must be greater than your love for anyone else. So that if someone else wants to take you a different direction than the Lord wants to take you, you walk with God and they gotta, they got to find their way. They, they've got to do whatever they've got to do. Am I making sense? And so, so that's the kind of love the Lord wants. And so he said, he, so, so the Lord just says, you know, that's what, he, he could see it before he ever got here. That's what I want. I want someone who has that kind of dedication to me, that kind, that kind of heart for me and, and, and what I want. And you see it whenever they were born, whenever they started growing up. You know, Isaac, uh, I mean uh, uh, Esau. Esau marries a certain woman. You know, he's, you know, he's, he's a, a hunter and he's doing all the things that he's doing. And he marries a certain wo woman. He finds out his parents aren't happy with that because, because uh, Jacob... Um, he was, uh, Jacob was being sent over to, to uh, Laban, who is his mother's brother, over there to, to, get a, to, to find a wife. And, and so, so Esau, you know, he's always playing catch up. Always playing catch up in what he does. Because he just didn't have the heart. God wants us to have a heart for him where we give ourselves to him and he's number one with us. Are you getting anything out of any of this? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Got a couple of people getting some. All right. So I'm going to stop right there because it's 743. And we'll take up here at verse 14 next week.